Welcome, gentlemen. I think it would be a good idea to start this session with a bit of a scene setter as to where we are in terms of VC. Um, globally, venture capital investment has had a really slow start of the year, very weak first half, but one of the bright spots has been artificial intelligence. And we have some new stats for FII today. The AI market value will be nearly $2 trillion by 2030, according to Accenture, which means this market will grow by 2,000% by then. Now, should we be concerned by this? Is there a bit of hype in this market, some of the valuations we're seeing in AI? Antonio, kick us off. Uh, there's definitely a bubble in AI, yes. Sure. <laughs> um, you know, we've been investing in this space since uh, 2009, 2010. So our first investment was DeepMind that was then sold to Google. And we've watched, uh, I call it the AI winter, and now a bubble is usually happens. It, I think, started with kind of the retail investor and, uh, and open AI. So the, the advent of the chatbot really woke people up to this as a um, kind of the iPhone moment of our intelligence. It was almost a year ago. It was almost a year ago, yeah. And I think the, um, for us, the, the iPhone moment, the aha moment was really AlphaGo or AlphaZero. And we were surprised people didn't wake up to that. But for sure, it seems to us now there's a, there's a frothy bubble. He's mentioned the B word, bubble. <laughs> yes. Shaving, what do you think? I think, I think that um, AI plus, I would add, I'm excited about the merger of quantum computing and AI. And I've been investing in quantum computing uh, for over a decade, AI for the last seven years. Uh, so I agree with you. I think there's a lot of froth and, uh, in, a, in a market that has you know, been corrected as severely as it has. Uh, people are looking for something exciting to, to invest in in the future, and, uh, but we have to be disciplined about the valuations. There's, I think, OpenAI, there's rumors that it's being valued at $80 billion today, and I haven't seen a lot of uh, investments at $80 billion valuation in the private markets that end up doing really great afterwards. Uh, if you look at Stripe at $100 billion, um, you know, you see when the corrections happen, um, you know, it doesn't pan out. However, if you zoom out and you look out to the next 10 years, 20 years, the unbelievable disruption that AI will do and quantum will do together, um, you know, will make the bubble look, uh, might make sense, if you, if you, if you know what I mean. So. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? So are you saying that so much focus now is on large language models, chatbots? I feel like it's stolen the oxygen from the rest of the AI sector. Where are you investing, Antonio? What interests you now? Because perhaps the age of investing in a big LLM is over. Yeah, so I'll start by saying that um, I think Sherman's right. Look, if you look out 10 years from now, for sure, some of the companies that got valued highly will do well and will look great. The LLMs in particular, we're not investing in. And we have not, we've chosen not to because our strategy in the space, whenever you see a platform shift, is to invest in infrastructure and uh, applications that we believe have high return capital. And the problem with the LLMs from our perspective is that uh, everything is free. The data is free, the models are basically free, and the capital intensivity to actually operate them is very high. So you need huge data store capacity. So if you add sort of high capital intensivity plus no moat in the business at all around the data or the model, we think ultimately these are just commoditized products. And regulation will likely disrupt some of this quite a fair bit. Yes, I mean, it's, it's an unknown, right? So when you have that over overhang, regulatory overhang, on top of these dynamics of you know, no moat and of high capex, it makes us nervous. You're interested in AI, but as you mentioned, colliding really with another technology, quantum. Yeah. Talk to us about the potential there and why you see that as a bright spot. Uh, I, I, I'll give an example. I, I, in the laboratory uh, out of Cambridge University, a company was born called PsiQuantum, <clears throat> PSI. Um, and I've been looking at the quantum space, hoping and dreaming that it would actually uh, become a marketplace, and just in 2021, the first sales started to happen for companies like D-Wave, IonQ, and I'm an investor in both, both of those companies, and they were the first quantum companies to go public. PsiQuantum is working on using photonics, which will kind of solve the heat problem uh, in, in quantum. Uh, the, the current designs generate a lot of heat, so you need a lot of cooling. So data centers for what I call cloud computing, but with a Q, uh, quantum cloud computing, uh, need a solution. PsiQuantum is going to hit 1 million qubits uh, by 2020, uh, 2032. Uh, we're at like 5,000 qubits today. So a million qubits uh, is like the power of God, uh, <laughs> the mind of God. And we'll be able to solve 
problems that would take us a billion years to solve with our current compute, uh, computing power. Uh, so at that point, the human brain has difficulty understanding what advances will happen um, and how it will impact our civilization, but it, it will be a foundational impact. It's bigger than the mobile revolution, bigger than the internet, um, bigger than all of these kind of, bigger than, than the industrial revolution. Uh, and that took 150 years, whereas this is going to take, you know, 10 to 20 years. How it's hard? really fast. But given this, how hard is that for you both to put a valuation on some of the businesses you speak to? Because if you're investing in a technology that is in the sort of early stages of development, but has huge potential, but maybe have no customers, how challenging is that for you? I mean, look, we've been doing it for 25 years, right? So it, it's not our first cycle. It's not sure it's first rodeo. We've seen bubbles before. The reality is it's trying to pick, I mean, great companies, great products with great teams. It's very simple in all sectors, whether it's AI or some other sector, and eventually they will win. I mean, great. For us, it really comes down to those two things. Is the product really going to work? And does the engineering work? So in Quantum's example, the engineering does work. It's a matter of time. And is the team great? If you get those two things right, price matters, but what really matters is the future, as, as Sherman described. I do believe there's going to be multiple tri trillion dollar companies in the AI space. The question is going to be, you know, people say, well, what's going to be the Google of AI? It might be Google is the Google of AI. <laughs> I was going to say Google right? might. <laughs> um, and so I think there's going to be the AI wars, like similar to what we saw in uh, the Uber wars. And all, you know, when, you, when you invent a new industry, um, there are major tectonic plates that begin shifting. And large companies might become small companies, and small companies might become large companies in record time. Um, so, I, like Antonio said, this isn't our first rodeo. Um, I do think it, it is only, we're only in the first inning. And so I think we have to temper some of the excitement uh, and, and invest over the long haul in foundational in technologies and breakthroughs. Making sure excitement doesn't sort of bleed into disillusionment, I suppose. What milestones do you give founders today to try and develop some of these technologies that still need a lot of development? So we, we invest across the early stage and late stage, depending where we are in the cycle of the company. Um, in the very early stages, it's typically engineering milestones. So are we actually hiring great people and are they achieving the engineering tasks required? And does that allow us to sort of continue to fund the company over time? As we go later stage, we do want to see companies actually being commercialized. So we will uh, look at commercial milestones and how the customer, like the product market fit works for the customer. I've been shocked by how many tech companies don't invest in their regulatory policy teams. Um, mm. I helped build the first regulatory policy teams at Uber and Airbnb. I brought Jim Messina from Obama's uh, campaign. He was the camp Obama's campaign manager. Uh, later, David Pluff joined the company. And we kind of invented the idea of regulatory arbitrage. Um, Regulatory and AI is going to be absolutely foundational. We have to, and, and these companies need to invest in having incredible regulatory talent, uh, policy talent. And so, uh, to the ones I talk to, I, I ask them, you know, what do you have there? What are your, what are you thinking? Because government will control what, how AI is implemented around the world. And how commonly do the businesses you speak to have that covered? I think I. <laughs> Um, it, it's frustrating in, in a lot of tech companies, they, they, they've not valued it as much. However, I think the dawn of when ChatGPT became, you know, 100 million users in 90 days, it woke the entire world up. And, and I think that's been the disruption that has made everyone, both in terms of government and in terms of companies, realize this is something they need to focus on. There is so much discussion about regulation from the EU, from the US, even from the companies themselves. At what stage do you think we will have something concrete that companies can work with? Oh, I think we have it now. So I'll give you an example. We have, um, I'm here with Zipline. You, you met Keller, the founder of Zipline. It's one of the most exciting companies I've seen since Tesla. And what Keller did is he went to Africa. To, this company actually uh, has autonomous drones for the delivery of blood and drugs in Africa, and now it's coming back to the US. Uh, for both healthcare and, and retail delivery. Uh, he went to Africa for five years, built the system in Rwanda you, with the Rwandan F, uh, F version of the FAA, and then brought that regulatory regime back to the US. The US FAA adopted a very similar regime. He created the regime he's operating in, and uh, about a month ago it was approved. We have the only system flying in the US now. Um, he has the more autonomous models than anyone phone in the world. It's going to be the largest commercial airline by the end of this year in the world. 
That, to me, is the right regulatory engagement. It's finding a place like here, you know, like in Saudi Arabia or in, in, in the Gulf region here, where you have uh, regulators that are willing to work with companies very quickly and build your regime and then have it populate around the world. It's, I think it's better to try and build that future than it is to sort of be a, a taker from the, from the governments when governments want to partner with companies. And that's what we look for. I, I, I'm, I'm seeing companies uh, that are going from 40,000 customer support you know, uh, employees, uh, support staff, to 1,000 in the next 12 months. Uh, 10,000, another one is doing for going from 10,000 to, to less than 1,000. And so uh, the, the job disruption that I, I fear is going to happen over the long term is really being accelerated, and it's going to be in these types of roles. Um, so we also need to think about uh, what is the definition of a job and how are we going to replace these jobs? What are people going to do? Because there could be an age of despair, uh, even in the next two to three years, where you suddenly have masses of people that are being un 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 unemployed uh, because of AI technology and the efficiency that it brings. And I think we need to think, think deeper about new ideas that systemically can heal some of mm. those, those uh, breaks that are going to happen. And one idea I just want to propose here on stage, uh, I, I did it at the conclave with uh, Peter Diamond, this is a dear friend, on, on, and we did a conclave here on AI. And this idea came out of my Uber experience. Um, you look at self-driving, uh, and I, I believe self-driving is really kind of the first killer app of AI uh, that's in the streets, it's working. Um, you've, you've seen in uh, Waymo now, is in San Francisco, it's in Santa Monica. So it's beginning to happen. So you have millions of drivers that are going to be replaced by self-driving cars. I believe that we could actually build a system where the, the, the drivers today uh, participate in a, in a program where they begin to become owners in, in fleets of self-driving cars. They become small business people who actually own, manage, and maintain fleets of self-driving cars. Um, and they begin to get great, gain passive income from, from that kind of opportunity. I call this kind of universal basic opportunity, not universal basic income. You shouldn't just give handouts to people, enable them, give them, give them uh, empower them, and give them ownership in the very technologies that are going to disrupt their lives, but create opportunity out of it. But this is a discussion that needs to be happening right now. I mean, right we're now. already seeing huge disruption in jobs. And according to McKinsey, this is a new stat for FII as well, 50% of work will be automated from 2030 to 2060, which is huge. It's not just customer service and coding and driverless taxis. It'll probably be all of our jobs will be in some way disrupted by artificial intelligence. So Antonio, that's one example. How else do we ensure that this future that we are carving out at breakneck speed, you know, much faster than the Industrial Revolution, this right. disruption, right. how do we ensure that the future that we create is utopian, not dystopian? Right, Star Trek, not Terminator, right? That's how I think about <laughs> right. it. Yeah, and I'm more of a Star Trek fan, by the way. So I'm, 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 I'm an optimist uh, by nature. You know, I was, um, I was with a, a senior decision maker yesterday in the region, and he pointed out to me, that at the time of uh, the Gutenberg printing press, so you know, around 1455 or so, uh, the same things were being said about the printing press. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take out lots of jobs. Um, we're going to have lots of deep fakes of the Quran and the Bible and other, other books. Uh, we, should, we should regulate it. And it was banned, actually, in many parts of the world because of this. Uh, I, I, I take that view. I think that I think Sherman's right. There will be many, many interesting solutions that humanity comes up with to solve this problem. And the, over time, we will figure this out. I believe we will figure this out. There will be some disruption, right? There'll be some time where it, there's any possibly social unrest over this, but we will figure this out. And so I'm very optimistic about it. I think markets will ultimately win, and humans have adapted new technology throughout history. It's another technology step for us. You sound more passive than Shervin here, who wants to take a more active role in, in sorting out job disruption. Do you think that this will work itself out without decisions being made by governments, by companies? Well, governments will make decisions and companies will make decisions. The question is, will they make the right ones? This is the question. So, <laughs> you know, will you have unintended negative consequences in the decisions you make? And so I think the right answer is to go through time, uh, see the problems you're facing, and then re resolve those problems. I think anticipating with regulatory frameworks what might happen, you don't know what's going to happen, could actually chill development. 
So I think we want to be careful about the balance between the regulatory framework, which we need to have, and how we apply these rules and what happens to the development of the, of the technology. We don't want to ban the printing press. We don't want to have these kind of knee-jerk reactions to what's happening. I think we want to embrace this and find a way to make humanity better, not so much be afraid of it, but think about how to work with it. The other risks that we see here, beyond job disruption, which is, of course, right now, we see misinformation, that's an issue for now. We see the risk of AI weaponry, automated AI. And, of course, if you look further forwards, the existential crisis of uh, AI for humanity, and we've seen lots of AI CEOs, lots of people in this area co-sign a number of letters. How concerned are both of you? Is this a conversation you have with founders? These are deep conversations that are happening, for sure, um, at dinners, at meetings, at board meetings. Um, I think we all realize that we're, we're in probably, we're about to witness civilizational change. Um, I think, you know, I, I've, I've held the view that we're kind of at the end of whatever this current civilization is and the beginning of something else. And if it leads to Star Trek, great. Um, but it could also... Let's hope. Be, yeah. But <laughs> if it leads um, to the Matrix. But we need, yeah. to be, we, need to, we need to be visionary and creative and we need to fi fi really focus on uh, you know, what is best for humanity. Uh, humanity doesn't exist to make companies profitable. Humanity exists so that we can actually have... This is breaking news for FII. <laughs> <laughs> but, but at the end of the day, um, what I, my hope and dream is that you know, people are going to be given time back, time back to be with their families, to explore their passions in, 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 uh, in their communities, uh, to be with their families, to find more time to uh, really go back to the village from where we came from. So I have this kind of like more idealistic view and hope that if we manage things correctly, uh, we could be in a renaissance like what happened after, after the printing press, um, but a renaissance of, of both wisdom being democratized and also freeing humans from just only working uh, to be able to put food on the table to uh, actually pursuing pursuits that they're, they're passionate about and inspire them in their communities. Antonio, I'm going to give you the last answer. Yeah, How it, concerned should we be? Yeah, I mean, so inside the human brain, um, in the amygdala, is both fear and compassion. And I think we need to recognize that our fear is stronger than our compassion. It's how it's actually designed, so we stay safe as humans. We are going to have to understand ourselves much better in this period of time. I think that's, it's, it's the most important thing, is understand what it means to be a human, understand how technology interacts with us, and look, you carry around a brain in your head that's about three and a half pounds and the most powerful per ounce computer in the world. This is the reality. If we embrace that and embrace our humanity and embrace how we help each other, I think we're going to end up in a Star Trek future. I love to end on a positive note. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, I think it tees up the next session rather well as well. Thank you very much Thank to you. both of our panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.